when you've been in Formula One for a longer period of time, you're thinking, I need to keep performing because there are kids coming up the junior series who do want to take my seat. Yeah, absolutely. So, but that's always been the way and it always should be the way uh, is perform or, or move along. It's the pinnacle of motor racing. Um, and that's the lovely thing about Formula 2. You've got this hungry grid of 22 drivers trying to displace someone from Formula 1. Hello and welcome to The Fast and the Curious with me, Christian Hugill. Now, I am the only regular on the podcast today. Betty is still very much in Australia doing coverage of the European Championships. It's all very exciting, but she will be back on the podcast very soon. It will it will not be a Betty Glover free zone for long. More on that later. And Greg uh, is still having time off. The last time you were with us, he was on holiday. He's still on holiday, so we're letting him have a bit of actual holiday. He can only be lured out of hibernation to record super tense game shows where we give away tickets to Silverstone. And by the way, if you didn't hear that on the last episode, do go and check that out. We gave away Silverstone tickets using comfortably my least favourite thing of the podcast, Beat the Christian, because it terrifies me. But it was good fun, and we gave away some Silverstone tickets. So, uh, Greg, back soon as well. But fear not, today isn't just a Hugh Gill monologue. Producer Jimmy's words, not mine, and I personally think that's a shame. Because this week, I have got a friend, we're being joined by a person who's never been on the podcast before, to look at Formula 2. With the driver market heating up in Formula 1, we thought it was a good time to look at some of the talent potentially on the way up to the top tier in the next couple of years. We will be chatting to the Williams Academy driver and Formula 2 driver, Zach O'Sullivan, later in the show. Very excited to speak to Zach. But first, to help us get up to speed with all things F2 is... F1 TV and Channel 4 commentator and official Formula 2 commentator as well. Welcome to the Fast and the Curious, Mr. Alex Jakes. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I was quite looking forward to the idea of a Hugh Gill monologue, but uh, fine. I shall I shall turn up. I shall interrupt. Let's have a conversation instead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, when, when I think it might be a Hugh Gill monologue, my go-to strategy, if you like, Alex, is find a commentator. If I need someone who can talk, the last time it was Crofty, now it's your good self. I just think if I need someone who can say some words, a commentator's a safe bet, isn't it? You lot can talk. Yeah, top waffle. Top waffle. It's a very loud row at the back of that grandstand. Um, for, for those who aren't aware, Alex is the commentator for, for Formula One for F1 TV and all the official F1 socials. You'll hear Alex's commentary also on Channel 4 in the UK on free-to-air coverage. Uh, it means me and Alex have the joy of speaking to each other on a different podcast and also seeing each other in the in the flesh occasionally at Grand Prix. And Alex, you're in the middle. We saw each other a couple of weeks ago in Canada. Since then, you've been at the Le Mans 24 hours. You are you are a busy man at the moment. Yeah, busy and very happy man. Uh, very grateful to be able to to commentate on these amazing events. Um, oh. Le Mans is such an epic event. Uh, it is it is frankly ludicrous if you started it from scratch now. Three hundred thousand spectators, sixty two <laughs> drivers. 62 entries in the field, 186 drivers. It's just when when you see the winners in the different classes, when you see the winners of the overall races, you can tell it, it means the world. And it should do after putting a day of your life in to trying to win one of the big, biggest prizes in sport, let alone motorsport. <laughs> it's it's ludicrous and wonderful. And it was a, a really lovely experience. And Christian, as you well know, coming off the best actual race that we've had in Formula One, Back oh, in Canada, for, of the for years, I would say. A, f- a fantastic race. Um, a, a, b- but before we dig too deep into the world of Formula 2, I mentioned that me and Alex see each other. We saw each other in Miami, um, where I was keeping in touch with the Fast and the Curious. And thanks to Greg James' mobile phone book, I am not the only one on this podcast with an Ed Sheeran story from that weekend, am I, Alex? Would you like to tell our listeners, because this is one of my favourite stories in F1, how you managed to interact with Ed Sheeran in Miami? Yes, one of the strangest things. So let's try and do the brief version of this, because I know not everyone listening to this esteemed podcast is a football fan. But I am, so it's fine. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. We're not just going to make this Ipswich and Leicester chat for the next hour, because I'm not sure anyone wants that. (laughs) I'm a, I'm a fan of a team called Ipswich Town. It's where I'm from originally. We have been absolutely terrible for 
for about two decades, specifically 22 years since we were last in the Premier League, uh, English football's top table. Uh, my friend Nate uh, was absolutely determined to get a picture with Ed Sheeran because Ed Sheeran is the sponsor of the club. He is, uh, you know, one of Suffolk's favourite sons. And he, his tour sponsors the club. And a, and a big fan as well, a massive Ipswich Town fan as well. And a, mass, and a massive fan, and, and brilliant that he is as well, uh, that he stayed true to his roots. So, um, yeah, so a uh, couple of colleagues sidle up to Ed, get a photo, and Ed gets this a lot because he has a lot of fans buy the Ipswich shirt not knowing who Ipswich are because it's got the tour, the sponsor, on the front. He says, are you actually Ipswich fans? They respond, yes. And there's not only two of us, there's a third. Christian Hugill, I am that third fan. So then Ed says, come and watch the game with me next time, uh, tomorrow. Uh, come and watch the game with me. Uh, I've got a place in my hotel that we can watch it. So on the Saturday of the Miami Grand Prix, the three of us went to, uh, <laughs> the three of us went to a hotel basically in the middle of nowhere that's shaped like a guitar. And we wandered into a room where Ed Sheeran and his lovely team uh, were in a in a part of the hotel which had the Ipswich game on about 20 TVs and we spent the next three hours uh, chilling out with Ed and watching Ipswich Town win the most important game for 22 years to get promoted back to the Premier League. Surreal, Christian, doesn't cover it. My brain will never recover from that. It was a wonderful way to celebrate promotion. Wonderful, Alex. And if you want to hear Ed Sheeran's views on the world of Formula One, <laughs> uh, scroll back on this feed to our Miami Grand Prix debrief episode. Normally the debrief, me, Greg and Betty sit there and go, wasn't the race good? On that one, we had Ed Sheeran on it because that's perfectly normal. Uh, scroll back to that. And, and yes, you'll hear me saying exactly the same on that episode um, in my Miami hotel. I'm saying, what a nice man. Brilliant. Uh, we're going to do some F1 chat later, but you spend a big chunk of time commentating on Formula 2. For anyone who hasn't been following the season as closely as yourself this year, uh, how exciting has it been? What sort of championship battle we got? What have been the highlights? A, a, a brief summary of F2 2024 so far. It's wide open in a way that I don't think anyone predicted. They introduced a new car. It's the same car for everyone. So the team and the driver have to make the difference. Only 12 people can work on the car. So it is weighted towards the driver having a massive say on what they can do. But when you introduce a new car... It's a level playing field for everyone. Sometimes we say that at the start of a season and the usual contenders, they come to the front of the field. The usual contenders being those who have done well in the previous year, moving into their second season and who are aligned to the academies. That's someone like Victor Martins, last year's Rookie of the Year. He's aligned to the Alpine Academy. That's someone like Oliver Behrman. You may remember him from the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix when he was in the points for Ferrari. He is aligned to that driver academy and has been for a really long time. They were our leading contenders coming in. We also had some exciting rookies in the mix. And what has happened, Christian, and I w this is not an exaggeration, is the form book has been shredded We've taken the contents of what was shredded and put it back in the shredder. It is the most competitive <laughs> championship I've ever seen. You can make a case that anyone going on a run and being a contender, and you cannot pick apart the top 10 at the moment. I've covered it for 10 seasons. I've never seen anything like it. It's lovely because I love watching it because you you, you can never guarantee a motorsport, but you know, you're pretty good chance you're going to get a great race. It can be quite chaotic because some of the drivers are younger and will just have a go and they've got little to lose. Yep. I think some of the biggest questions people will have listening to this, Alex, is the two names. It always feels in every F1 season, there's one or two names that people are like, right, they're the ones to watch. And this year has been Ollie Behrman, as you say, partly because he covered for Carlos Sainz in the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix and did a really good job. And also Kimi Antonelli because he's being linked with the Mercedes seat for next season. And we understand there's a damn good chance of getting it. They are the two headline names. Are they living up to their billing in F2 this season, Alex Jakes? No, but uh, it's a strange thing because of this new car. It's an ultra competitive championship. And there's a human element in that if you tell a 17 year old that he is the favorite to replace Lewis Hamilton, how is he meant to absorb that in what is going to be the last year of his life where he's a normal person? Mm. One of my the abiding memories of Charles Leclerc is the day before he won the Formula 2 championship. She was having a kickabout with the guy who won Le Mans at the weekend, Antonio Fuoco, who's his teammate that year, and his mechanics. 
And I was looking and I was thinking, that is the last time that he's going to be a normal guy because then he's going to be a Formula One driver. And then because of his talent, he's going to be a Ferrari Formula One driver. And the innocence and the anonymity is going to go. It's going to disappear. This is the last season where Kimi Antonelli is a normal guy because the expectation of coming in as an 18-year-old and replacing Lewis Hamilton, that is a ludicrously high bar to set. But they believe, Mercedes believe, that he is going to be on the same level as Max Verstappen. And that is why they are moving heaven and earth and they have been talking about him all the way through. Your question was about Formula 2. He's not been on the podium yet. So you've got the first part of that sentence where he's going to replace statistically the greatest driver of all time. And then the second part of that sentence of saying Oscar Piastri, Charles Leclerc, George Russell, Lando Norris, Alex Albon, these names that you know, these names that have progressed into Formula One, they had all been on the podium. They had all won races by this stage of their rookie season in Formula Two. So we know he's quick, but he's having to deal with expectation and try and deliver in a brand new car, having skipped past Formula Three. The exam questions he's answering right now, Christian, are monstrously hard. And Oliver Behrman, of course, he would have given the world to have that debut with Ferrari. But once you know that you can do it in Formula One, how difficult to then try and recalibrate mm. to go back to Formula Two, to almost go back to the day job. He knows he's a contender. He knows he can fight with the best drivers. He finished ahead in that race, Christian, of Lewis Hamilton and Lando Norris on merit in a fair fight. Mm. So those two names linked to Formula One, those two names massively talented. But starting this weekend, the Spanish Grand Prix, they need to go on a run in the European heartland races of getting themselves into the mix of at least the top five just so they can go into Formula One with a bit of momentum, because at the moment, this is not what we're used to seeing. I guess what we're saying, Alex, with those two drivers is, all right, they may not be at the top of the standings, but there are reasons for that, and they are showing glimpses of that potential. I personally believe, from whispers I've heard around Formula One, both of them will be in Formula One next season. I think Behrman will be at Haas. I suspect Antonelli will be at Mercedes and for whatever reason, if they were to go, that might be too much too soon. I think he'd end up at Williams. You're a man more in the know than me. Do you think they will be in F1 next season? A hundred percent. I think both drivers will be on the grid uh, when we line up for the first race of the season in Australia. Um, I think the only way Antonelli would not be at Mercedes would be if they were able to secure if Mercedes were able to secure Max Verstappen uh, for 2025, nothing suggests that's the case. Um, that I think it's the only way Kimi Antonelli would end up at Williams. Uh, and that door might shut, that option might shut if Williams secure Carlos Sainz, because then what a driver lineup that is of Sainz and Albon. Mm. Uh, Kimi Antonelli, from everyone that I trust in the paddock, who has seen him at private test sessions and saw him in Formula Regional last year where he was one winning the title, uh, believes that he's a generational talent. Oliver Behrman won four races in his rookie season and when he was winning, different types of performance every time. Could defend, could attack, and when it all came together, uh, he was out of reach of some incredible contenders who had more experience than him. So these are two hugely exciting prospects, obviously very young, um, mm. And whilst the season isn't going 100% to plan for them in Formula 2, they're going to be in Formula 1 for a while. Um, and it, how exciting to see young talent in, a, in an era, Christian, where rookies have kind of gone out of fashion. These two absolutely exciting, dynamic drivers are going to get their chance. That is really interesting, Alex. And the next F2 race weekend is Barcelona this weekend. Before we look ahead to that, let's have a quick chat about the last F2 race in Monaco uh, because the man we're about to hear from on the podcast, Zach O'Sullivan, had a fantastic win. Talk us through that a little bit. One thing I love about Formula 2 is you see things in the races that you just don't get anywhere else. And Zach O'Sullivan was minding his own business, trying to have a good weekend, but qualifying in Monaco can be a fickle beast. He ends up 15th on the grid, Christian. 
Even in Formula 2, it's very, very tricky to overtake in Monaco. So he has to go for the alternative strategies. Everyone else starts on the right tyre, the sensible tyre, uh, and marks off what they're doing. He's going to go long. He's going to pit at the end. And he's going to carry on and carry on and carry on. Tyre degradation isn't a problem. So he tootles on and tootles on and tootles on. But the pace was excellent. And are we giving away what happened? Are we talking about what happened before we go to him? Oh, we're giving away what happened. Okay. That's absolutely fine. Yeah. It's, it's, we, we know by now we're happy to do the spoilers. But in this modern era, you've got to check, Alex. I, I wanted to check in case we were going to be all dramatic and reveal it the with the man. On-demand world we live in. <laughs> reveal it with the man himself. The chances of this happening, Christian, are, I think, the longest odds of anything I've ever seen in Formula 2. The chances of getting... Two drivers making contact with each other when they come out of the pits that brings out a yellow flag that's upgraded to a virtual safety car. But after he's come into the pits, because you can't pit under the virtual safety car in Formula 2, and then to get out in the lead and win your first Formula 2 race, it's in the millions to one. Spectacular. So to summarise, he has a bad qualifying. He stays out on old tyres for ages and ages and ages, gets up to the front, then... Just when you have, oh, it'd be good if we had a safety car, it'd be good if we had a safety car. He doesn't quite get a safety car, but he gets yellow flags, he gets a virtual safety car. And even though you can't pit under a virtual safety car in Formula 2... He's in the pits before. He got in the pits before. So it's just that element of, like, he had to be in exactly the right track position to get in before they upgraded it, which is just... Phenomenal. Uh, un unbelievable. It is practically a miracle win... What better time for him to make his debut on the Fast and the Curious? <laughs> this is what happened when I caught up with F2 feature race winner in Monaco, Zach O'Sullivan, here on the Fast and the Curious. Zach O'Sullivan, welcome to the Fast and the Curious. What an absolute pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me. No, uh, happy, to, happy to be here and uh, have a chat. Well, we've got a lot to chat about, not least Monaco, which I want to get onto in a minute but we know from our lovely listeners who are a vocal bunch Zach they talk to us a lot that we've got a lot of people who are new to not just F1 but motorsport in general really so obviously we've spoken about the structure we've spoken about Formula 3 and Formula 2 before you're racing in Formula 2 where would we have found you before racing this season yeah so last year I was in F3 um, so yeah on the ladder on the road to F1 if you like uh, I think like most I started karting quite young when I was eight years old and, uh, and yeah, I've kind of taken the, the steps up through there um, and have been yeah, competing on the F1 weekends in the support series for the last uh, two years. Amazing stuff. And, and obviously, when I ask this question, I'm aware you've just won your first race. But well, as I said, we'll go <laughs> on to that in a minute. How have you found getting into F2 and how have you found that step up from F3? How are you enjoying the season? I'm enjoying it. Um, on the surface, it's not that different. Uh, the championships are run by the, the same organization, the same people. It's the same paddock, uh, a lot of the same teams. But I think it's, it's more the weekend schedule with, with a feature race, with a pit stop, um, different tyre compounds through the weekend. Um, and in the end, I mean, it's designed to prepare you for F1. So, uh, yeah, the jump from F3 to F2, I think, is, is more managing that side of things, managing a longer races, tyre management, etc. cetera, um, in, the, in the bid to prepare you for F1. Uh, and you're in a great place. For, for those unaware, Zach was runner-up in F3 last season. Great result. Promoted to F2 with the ART team, who are um, who s absolutely know what they're doing in Formula 2, one of the, the very established teams. And your start to the season certainly got interesting in Monaco, didn't it, Zach? Now, we speak to Formula 1 drivers on this podcast who say that it is the ultimate test. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um... No, I was lucky enough to race race Monaco last year in F3 as well. Um, my first time on a street circuit, which was a bit of a <clears throat> an eye opener. But um, no, it's a track I love. Um, I think it's one of the kind of one old school street circuit we have left on the calendar. Really, um, the rest I think are kind of made up of highways and they're, they're street circuits because there's walls. But Monaco is is different. There's bumps, there's manhole covers, there's lots of camber. Um, you really feel like you are driving on streets. Um, and no, it's a track I really enjoy driving. It's a, it's a proper adrenaline rush. Um, and, and yeah, like I said, I enjoyed it up until the future race. The weekend wasn't going quite to plan um, with a few issues in qualifying. But, uh, but no, it turned around pretty quickly after that. Right, let's talk about this feature race. I watched the race and you were middle of the pack. And then 
if I'm right in following the race, Zach, and you had a closer view of it than me, so you'll correct me if I'm wrong, you were running in the middle of the pack, all nicely, and then it looked like a late strategy. It looked like a, a, a late pit stop that you were planning to stop late, and therefore you were slowly, as others pitted around you, climbing up the grid. So was that late pit stop part of the strategy in the first place? It was. Um, not maybe that late, but it was part of the plan. And uh, yeah, it kept going longer and longer. The pace kept going better and better. Um, luckily, at the end for me, there was a safety car or a virtual safety car, which in the end gave me the win. Um, but I think we were fighting for, for P4, or P5 um, with no safety car. And my engineer was telling me, we're in a good position. Uh, if there's a VSC or a safety car, we win the race. And I thought, you know, that's great, but there's not going to be a safety car. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, OK. <laughs> we had an hour long strategy meeting the night before. And it was like, God, if there's a safety car at this point, and I was like, yeah, but there's not going to be a safety car. So my main focus, to be honest, was was going as quickly as I could um, in the f hope I'd come out at least within the top five. Um, but I was never really thinking about the win. So when it's happened, you do like, this is happening. It's like that the US office gif. It's like, this is happening. Yeah, yeah. Are you having to calm down in that moment? Or are, is your heart pumping? What's going on when you're like, oh, my God, this is it. This is it. Yeah, it was actually quite tricky. Um, obviously, I came out of the pits on, we've got no tyre warmers in F2. Um, and when it went green, obviously, I had no temperature in the tyres and had jar behind, had, had a lot of temperature. So I didn't actually get the chance to put any energy into the tyres. Um, so that was the hardest bit, actually, was actually trying to push with quite low grip. I knew it was Monaco, so apart from maybe the, the harbour chicane in the heck and you couldn't overtake. Um, but still, it was a bit like, oh, I haven't got much grip here. Um, but no, I, I hung on, it was, it was fine. I just want to know what's going through your head then when you, when you see the chequered flag and you're winning in Monaco. Like, that is a, a, a feeling that very few racing drivers in any series will ever get winning around Monaco. How did you feel? Honestly, because it all happened so late, it didn't really sink in. Um, I think, you know, if you're leading a race from the start and, and you, you know you're going to win, you, you kind of realise it a bit more. But for me, I, it was all kind of the last five minutes of the race were, were the most hectic five minutes. And suddenly um, I'm on the cool down lap and I've won. Um, <laughs> so it took a while to sink in. Um, of course, a, a really cool result, especially I think when you, when you don't expect it. It always means a, a bit more. And your first F2 podium as well. Again, what a place to do it. I, I imagine you could get used to that feeling. Yes. Um, like all podiums, you can get used to the feeling. Um, but, um, but no, a super cool result. And I think a really cool way to, to get my first win and, and podium in F2. It slightly reminded me of... Was it... I think it was Lando winning in Miami when there was all the radio calls going we're not going home. Now, I understand there was a similar thing with you. You asked the team to reschedule your flight home. Did you get to soak in some celebrations last uh, on the last night or did you have to jump immediately on a plane? No, no, I, I, I did. Uh, I did get to stay. Great. For, for two reasons, actually. It was it was my preference because it was mandatory. If you win a race on the GP weekends, you have to go to dinner with the Prince on Sunday. So um, you have to stay for that. I bet you're okay with that, weren't you? That was... <laughs> That was probably fine to stay for. Exactly. But the first rush, actually, after I done all the media duties after the race, uh, I drove to Nice to buy a suit because I had a suit with me because it's black tie. It was a bit of a mess. But, um, but in the end, that's why I had to stay for the, for the Prince's dinner. <laughs> At any point, did you catch yourself? i like, I'm suit shopping in Nice, just outside Monaco. How's this happened? Honestly, it was, it was bad because I was... I, I don't know if you saw, but I jumped in the water, which I regret now. I lost a, a bet with... Paul Aaron, who finished third, to jump into the the harbour. So I was covered in salt water, champagne, running around Nice Airport, trying to buy a suit. It wasn't very glamorous. Zach, you're part of the Williams Academy setup. We're we're good mates with Williams on this podcast. Not least Alex Albon, who um, Alex is one of our favourites because he is comfortably one of the maddest Formula One drivers on the paddock um, in terms of. You never know what he's going to come out with. What are the Williams guys, Logan as well, of course, like to learn from and soak up? Is, is there any serious side to Alex Albon at all? No, there is. I've seen Alex in his workplace. Um, but um, no, they're, they're great to be around. Obviously, I joined the team when I was really young. I just turned 17, 16, 17. And 
it's a good atmosphere. Um, I think it's always been a kind of almost family orientated team. Um, it's not the biggest team, but you, you get to know everyone very quickly. Um, and everyone was welcomed to you with, with open arms. And of course, you've graduated from Formula 3 to Formula 2. You're only 19, so, you know, plenty of time. But I'm guessing as soon as an F2 driver makes it to F2, they want to go one more number down as well. I'm imagining long term, you're thinking to yourself, keep pumping in weekends like Monaco and, and, and trying to um, sort of wave at James Vowles as he walks past and say, listen, I'm not doing bad here, you know, if you need someone for the future. I mean, yeah, that, that, that's, the plan. that's also the plan of the other 21 drivers in F2 is to perform as, as best as you can. Um, of course, quite a, a volatile driving market, which is always nice being in the rung below. More opportunities than, than maybe a normal year. But, but like always, my priority is performing in the series that, that I'm competing in to hopefully at least Give me my give myself the best chance of making it to have fun. Zach, just finally, we, we love speaking to our drivers about on track stuff on this podcast, but we also we like to get to know the people behind the racing as well. Outside of racing, Zach, what's life look like for you? I'm gonna ban you from one answer because normally when we say this to F one drivers, they always go, Max Verstappen, for example. Every time he comes on, says, well, sim racing. So, yeah, no, not another racing thing. We get it. You like racing. Fine. What, what, what's a Zach O'Sullivan passion outside of racing? What might we find you doing when you're off? I'm quite artistic into graphic design. Oh, fun. Not professionally. I did a bit in lockdown, actually. I was designing other racing drivers' helmets. It's a bit of fun. I enjoy it. And... It's something I can kind of switch off with. Yeah, well, this is good. Now, I have I've, I've thought of something here. I've got an idea. It's a good one. We're about to launch some merch because our listeners have been pestering us since day one of launching the podcast for some T-shirts and some caps and that sort of thing. Zach, if you're ever in need of some sort of, um, I wouldn't say work experience, but, you know, some experience to get your designs, if you'd ever be up for designing us some merch... We'd love to have you on board. You could be our official, not only our official F2 representative now, which I hope you realise you are. Now we've had you on, we'll, we'll I'm check in again. <laughs> well, you've been adopted by the Fast and the Curious family, exactly. But you could also come on board as our official merch consultant. That is a position that's open to you, should you want Sounds it, fun. Zach. No, I, yeah, I enjoy it. I design my own helmets um, and everything. So, uh, yeah, I'd be open for that. There you go. Right. This is fantastic. I'll put you in touch with Greg James, the principal producer, Jimmy, and we'll, and, we'll, and we'll get the ball on. This is exciting. Zach, such a pleasure to speak to you. Congratulations on that Monaco win once again. And we're hoping for a double in Barcelona. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Zach O'Sullivan on The Fast and the Curious. What a pleasure to speak to you. I really enjoyed that. Great to get inside his first F2 win. And something I wanted to talk to you about, Alex Jakes, is... The point Zach was making there about the F2 paddock being very much aware of what's happening in the F1 world at the mm. moment, which obviously you'd imagine they would be. But obviously last year, we had the, the historic thing where there were no driver changes from 2023 to 2024. It's not the case this year. We know there are going to be driver changes, potentially even before the end of this Formula 1 season. Um, and those lads in Formula 2 must be thinking, Hello, we've got a chance here. It must be an exciting time to be in the F2 paddock because it feels like there is scope for several of them, as we've already discussed on this pod, for them to step up. Yeah, the champion this year, if it's not Antonelli or Behrman, and long way to go, we finish in Abu Dhabi, everything could change. But let's say we get another name there. They're going to go, what about me? And rightly so, because they've beaten two incredible talents to this prestigious championship. Mm. So the rest of the field... As, as Zach said, the rest of the field know that. And so if you ever tie up to a Formula 1 team like he does with Williams, you've got every opportunity if you can go on a run. That's what I think mm -hmm. our champion will now do in these, in these races. Spain, Austria, Silverstone, this triple header. If you go on a run and you get two feature race wins in that, in that period, you're going to vault up the, the championship standing. So, yeah, targets on the back for Antonelli and Behrman and an opportunity for the rest if they can get ahead of them. We should say, this is the question I get asked the most uh, as someone who talks to me to find out more about F1 and then brings F2 into the equation. People say, well, why isn't there an automatic thing if you, get pro you win Formula 2, you get promoted to Formula 1? I suppose the short answer to my own question is because that is not the way sports contracts work. Yeah. But we should point out, shouldn't we, if you look at the case of Theo Porcher, who won F2, hasn't made it to F1 yet, it took Nick DeVries a long time 
when he did make it, it didn't work out. Mick Schumacher won the championship. He only stayed in F1 for a couple of years. Even winning the Formula 2 championship doesn't guarantee, A, a Formula 1 seat, or B, Formula 1 success. It's more complicated than that, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's always going to be more complicated than that. And there's a myriad of factors why things work out and why they don't work out. Mm. Timing really is everything. Where the Formula 1 team is, uh, if you're part of the Williams Academy, for example... In the past, you might get a chance, but you might be miles off the pace. If you get a chance to come through the ranks now and Williams give you a chance, you're going to be going to a team that's gone through a modernization process. So it's going to be far more functional. Um, it's not always the fairest story. To be honest, I wouldn't be against guaranteeing a, a spot on the grid. But the problem is there's only 20, there's only 20 seats, Christian. So uh, the Formula 1 teams have to do best for their organization when you've got a responsibility to hundreds of people, in some teams' case, thousands of people, you've got to put the two best drivers that you believe in there. But that's why I'm so happy that they're, we've got two rookies that look likely that they're going to progress going into next year. But it, but it is an important part of F1, isn't it, Alex? We talk about then about the likes of Nico Hulkenberg and Kevin Magnussen. Uh, Nico's obviously got his future sorted. He's going to Sauber, which will become Audi. But drivers like that, they are looking over the shoulder a bit, aren't they? Particularly when you've been in Formula 1 for a longer period of time. You're thinking, I need to keep performing because... There are kids coming up the junior series who do want to take my seat. Yeah, absolutely. So, but that's always been the way, and it always should be the way. Uh, it's perform or, or move along. It's the pinnacle of motor racing, um, and that's the lovely thing about Formula Two. You've got this hungry grid of twenty-two drivers trying to displace someone from Formula One. I love it when drivers get to Formula One, and it's, it's wonderful in the last few weeks when you've had Lando's breakthrough win. Uh, and you've had Charles, who I've, I've commentated on Charles Leclerc in the third tier, the second tier and the first tier. Um, there are moments for drivers we know the names of and we can't imagine Formula One without them. There were moments in their careers where one choice in the wrong direction, one bad race weekend. We might never have heard their names. They might never have got to Formula One. Mm. It's just the nature of the game. Um, and there are some quick people out there who have the ability to get there, who won't get there. So you have to celebrate the ones that do and their story along the way. It's a hard old world, isn't it? Uh, it's, let's move into Formula One, because speaking of ones that will get there, we both said we think Oli Behrman will be on the grid next season. We're as sure as we can be. Uh, therefore, him stepping into the Haas in free practice one in Barcelona this weekend... Again, we had Jack Doohan stepping into the Alpine in FP1 last time at Canada, uh, who is another one who I think has got a chance of the Alpine. So I don't think it's quite as nailed on as Behrman at Haas. But the think moves like this, they're significant, aren't they? Th this means something. The team principal at Haas, uh, Kamasa, has been very, very um, clear that Oliver Behrman's performance in FP1 is more important to him than his finishing position in Formula 2. So going through the team procedures, giving them a foundation at the start of the weekend. Essentially, he's running the program in a way that he can't do in Formula 2. Of course, Oli Behrman is going to perform in Formula 2 and get a good championship finishing position, but they're able to run the rule over him in FP1. So yeah, yeah FP1 is usually a right stretch. Let's get stuck into the weekend. Let's set things up and everyone else is getting up to speed. But for Oliver Behrman, that's probably the most important hour of his weekend. And talking about the F1 race itself, Alex, and moving on to the actual race as opposed to practice sessions, it feels to me at the moment, and this is lovely, isn't it? Like we're going into race weekends not fully knowing who's going to win. I was chatting to people in the paddock on Thursday in Canada. Everyone who I asked who do you think's got the pace this weekend said Ferrari. <laughs> they didn't even get out of Q2. Max won, but only just. On another day, Lando would have won. Barcelona is one of those tracks, isn't it, where it is a a, a good... If, you, if you've got a quick car in Barcelona, you've got a quick car. So they used to do pre-season testing there because it's got a variety of different corners. I am i can't think until the wheels turn who were, who's going to be the outright quickest. Can you? Yeah, I think Red Bull will be stronger here than they have been for the last three races. I, I think this is far more of a Red Bull circuit uh, than we've seen in recent weeks. Is that because what I just said about it being a circuit Enti where... Entirely, entirely that. Variety yeah. of corners, longer corners, faster corners. If you think about when we had a, a track kind of similar, if you go back to Suzuka, Max was not troubled. The difference is that if it's close here, it's going to be close at every race for the rest of the year. 
uh, if Red Bull are a little bit ahead, then it's still going to be a, a really entertaining race when we go to those circuits like in Singapore with, with the slower speed stuff where Red Bull has struggled in the past. Um, I don't expect it to be quite what we saw in the early part of the season though I think genuinely no matter where we go things have closed up but that's nice isn't it it is one of those circuits where it's a more general circuit so if you quick you're quick therefore because Red Bull have got a good all-rounder we expect Red Bull to be quick and yet we still can't sit here and say it's a nailed on Red Bull win because Ferrari and McLaren in particular have been making genuine steps forward. I suppose it'll also therefore be interesting to see where Mercedes have shaken up because there was talk yeah. in Canada that they feel like they have made a step forward. Now, we've heard that before with Mercedes in the last two years, but I'll be interested to see uh, if they actually turn up and how much closer they are to that sort of front three scrap. Um, before we go, uh, Alex Jakes, I just want to introduce you to a fast and curious feature. And I want to see if you would come to the same conclusion we would come to. We wanted a way of sort of mopping up the bits of Formula One news. You get you're sort of approaching silly season, you know, all these little bullet points of things we need to mention. We therefore sort of, me and Betty had in our head like a, a village notice board where you'd put things on and like oh this is something to mention this is something to mention and we thought who's most likely to run a village or community notice board of the formula one drivers who would that be who do you think it would be on the grid yes right the driver most likely to run the village notice board is george russell thank you (laughs) it just is isn't it it just is without doubt exactly it is just george russell so let's do george russell's community notice board two things i want to put on it this week alex the first being Since this podcast was last on air, the FIA um, have announced a rule that seems, and again, fortunately we've got you on because it's an F2 thing, seems to make it more feasible for drivers like Kimi Antonelli, young drivers, to actually get on the F1 grid. Now, we've seen a 17-year-old do it in the past, which is Max Verstappen, where a a sort of exception was made then. That's sort of been more formalised, hasn't it, now, with this new rule. Can you explain what's going on there? Yeah, essentially, it was a Max Verstappen rule in that there was a little bit of concern that he was being rushed through. So an age limit was imposed uh, at what stage you could enter Formula One. That's now been relaxed. If you've got the super license points, so if you've performed in junior motor racing championships and you have the set number of points uh, that the FIA require for promotion to Formula One, it now in exceptional circumstances, that they will they will ignore the 18 years old part of that rule, uh, which is common sense. Um, and you don't want to deny talent a chance to get straight on the grid because it didn't take Max Verstappen very long to be winning Grand Prix. And, did it? and yeah, there was fears that he was being rushed through because he was 17, but he took to it like a duck to water immediately. He never looked out of place. And I also remember similar conversations happening in the 2000s with Kimi Räikkönen. He was a little bit older, but again. Yeah. He he took to it like a duck to water. So it means, in theory, we could... I mean, in theory, we could see Kimi Antonelli before next season. In theory, he could jump into a Williams, I suppose, if he's got the super licence points. I think it could happen. I'm not certain it will. No. I don't think it'll happen in the near future. He's got some Formula 2 races to try and win. Sure. And uh, the second thing on George Russell's community notice board, and this is a good one for you as well, Alex, because I know you like a bit of politics. Uh, you, you like following a bit of politics. Now, if you're going to Silverstone next month, which I am and Alex is, and if you're lucky enough to be going all weekend, you might be getting there on Thursday, the 4th of July. If you're listening to this podcast in the UK, you may know that that is the same day as the UK general election. So if you're eligible to vote, it might be worth thinking about how you're going to cast your vote. Now, if you're not going to be at your polling station because you're either on the way to Silverstone or you're at Silverstone, there are still a couple of ways to do it. Now, by the time this episode goes out, the deadline for postal voting in the UK will have gone. So if you think, oh, I'm going to do a postal vote, you can't. But good news, you still can have a helpful friend or family member apply to go and vote on your behalf. You can apply for them to go and vote for you. It's called a proxy vote. You've got until the 26th of June to go and get that sorted so someone can go and vote for you. It's really easy. Just head to gov.uk forward slash how dash to dash vote gov.uk forward slash how dash to dash vote to get all the details. This stuff's important, isn't it, Alex? We don't want to miss out on voting because we're at Silverstone. Then we can go and concentrate on having a lovely weekend and know that we've cast our vote on trying to make the country better. You've got to use your vote. 
Uh, not everyone on the planet gets one. It's the most important thing. Um, politics affects every single aspect of everyone's life. You've surely got an issue that you care about. So use your vote and then enjoy the British Grand Prix weekend and that great festival of motor racing. It's going to be a very, very dramatic week for the UK. And how wonderful that we get to finish it off with a Grand Prix at Silverstone. So much going on that week. It is just an insane week in the British calendar. There's so much going on. Um, right, we'll be back on the Fast and the Curious on the other side of the Spanish Grand Prix, rounding up all the action for that. I'm very excited for Spanish Grand Prix weekend, Alex, not just because it's a Formula One weekend. I'm excited for all of them. I'm also going to see Girls Aloud on Saturday night. Uh, which, hey! Oh, can't wait. The greatest pop band, in my view, of, of our generation. <laughs> I am a huge fan. I mean, to be honest, Alex, if you're a homosexual above the age of 30, you have to like Girls Aloud. It's written into the contract. So I'm sort of... <laughs> I don't really have a choice, but I... So if I... I'd like to say to our listeners, if I sound slightly ropey on Sunday, I apologise. Uh, but there we are. I'm booking it in early. This might, this does happen, Alex, occasionally. I do say to our listeners, listen, there might be a hangar. I don't go to every race, as you know, as our listeners know. So... On races where I'm in the UK, it's like, right, am I, th- th- this is an official Christian Hugill hangover warning. I'm implementing it. I think people know what they're getting into. I think they know what the bargain is. Yeah. You know? This is it. This is it. It's fine. We, we, all like a, we all like a swift half a beverage of a weekend responsibly. Um, now, if all goes to plan, as well as a hungover me on that episode, we'll be joined by, we've not done this for a while, Alex. We like to get our listeners on as reserve drivers when one of the three of us aren't available and frankly nice. at the moment we're in a, we're in the fast and curious presenter crisis as one jets off on holiday and one jets off to work so we will hopefully have a reserve driver in barcelona so that's exciting we also we may well have betty glover live and direct from australia so that's exciting and then later in the week we're going to be looking ahead to silverstone announcing our plans in detail for if you are going when you can see us on the main stage i mean if you're going to be look at the main stage you're not gonna be able to avoid me i can only apologize for that uh and we'll also be taking you behind the scenes of a fun thing we're doing i might tell you this off air alex because you'll enjoy this very much uh we, we'll record we'll reveal all on the podcast next week and we'll be chatting with the williams driver and f1 academy advisor jamie chadwick who recently made history on the track in the usa so a busy week coming up in the land of the fast and the curious um alex you've had a very busy time Enjoy what little chill time you've got left before Spain. Thank you so much for joining us, Alex, and making your debut. This has been lovely. Really enjoyed having you on. Thank you for having me, and uh, great work with what you're doing on this podcast. It's a lot of fun. Oh, bless your heart, Alex. We're having a nice time, and it's nice to be able to chat to the young drivers coming up as well. Alex Jakes, you can hear him on Channel 4 and on F1 TV and on the Formula 2 coverage. Alex, thank you for the insight in F2 knowledge. We appreciate you joining us, and we will be back very soon with more from the fast and the curious. Bye for now. Thanks, Alex Jakes. Bye.